The earlier today, I sat down with investment advisor and fund manager Mark Faber. He's the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Doom and Boom report. He predicted the 87 crash, the tech downturn of 2000 and the market bottom in 2009. I asked him what he thinks we are seeing in equities right now. Well, I think we had huge moves from the March 2009 lows, and then we made an intermediate peak in April 2010, and then we had a big correction into July 1st, 2010. And since then, the S&P rose from 1,010 to a peak of 1,370 the other day. And so basically we had from the low in last July a rise of over 35%. And I think we need a correction period for these markets. Uh, mm. We need a shakeout both for commodities and for equities. And I think people always ask, why is the market going up? Why is it going down? And frequently you will know later on. I happen to think that the global economy is slowing down meaningfully at the present time and that earnings estimates are by and large too optimistic and that we will also have uh, significant geopolitical problems in the world. But you also say, and I, I think I'm reading from your least recent note, you're reluctant to heavily short U.S. equities right now. Is that because of quantitative easing? Well, I think that quantitative easing number two will come to an end, and the Fed will then wait for a while. And the moment the markets are down, say the S&P is down 20% or so, you'll have QE3, QE4 no, and so no forth. No doubt about it in your view. No doubt. No doubt. That, and also I believe that the fiscal deficit will not come down. It will rather increase going forward. Looks like a pretty ugly picture. A couple things I want to ask you, because you said maybe the market could correct 20%. Do you expect that? And I ask that because you've been pretty reliable in terms of some of your predictions. Yes, I mean, I think the market, if you look at the market internals, mm -hmm. many stocks are already down 20%, some are already down 30%. Mm -hmm. The market, the indices do not reflect what has been happening within the market because you have within the indices a few stocks that have been laggards before like Johnson & Johnson, right. Procter & Gamble. They are now kind of supporting the market. But individual stocks, a lot of them are down very substantially already. What do you make of a lot of defensive stocks have actually been doing well? Yes, I mean, I think what happened after July 2010, when we were at 1,010 on the S&P, mm -hmm. people rushed into the inflation trade. In other words, the reflation trade, and they bought resource stocks, oil stocks, and uh, increase their exposure to the potential of inflation. Right. And now people have second thoughts. The bond market has been rallying actually quite significantly. The dollar has stabilized and is rallying against the euro, which is also a sick currency. And people move into the defensive sectors, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, Utilities. and uh, consumer discretion, non-discretionary. Consumer um, staples. Do you have, so you have no doubt that we're going to see more quantitative easing though, and that's going to continue to prop up the market ultimately? Yeah, I think so. I think that, you know, I see sometimes predictions of S&P 400. I mean, if S&P 400, you'll have 250 quantitative easing before that. Right. And so S&P 400 could happen in real terms, inflation adjusted, but not in nominal terms. I think in nominal terms, the market actually will go up. Mark, as I mentioned, you've correctly called the, the 87 crash, you called the tech 2000 bubble. I mean, are you ready to call another crash? Is that 20% correction a crash in your view? I don't think no? it's a crash crash, because, uh, but it could happen. It could happen. You know, some events are beyond our control. I really think the situation in Pakistan is very bad. Well, let's talk a little bit about the overseas situation, because it's kind of interesting. What was it on Monday? We were all worried about Europe again, and then it seemed to ease down yesterday. Even today, we seem to kind of be marking time here. Uh, Europe, you're mentioning Pakistan. I mean, the Middle East, Europe. I mean, what is it that you're most worried about? You travel a lot. You spend a lot yes, of time on the I'm road. Yes, I'm not worried about Greece and Spain, uh, because they will have to restructure anyway. They're basically bust. But the ECB is like the Fed. They will continue to inject liquidity <laughs> into the system. And I mean, it's hard to believe that the euro is an even worse currency than the US dollar, because both are sick. I mean, extremely sick. I know sick. you hate the Terminally US dollar. You sick. hate the US dollar. Euros is bad, though? Yes, also. Very bad. I mean, both of them.
But my concern is a geopolitical issue. I think what is happening in Libya has woken up the Chinese because the Chinese, they used to get 60% of Libyan oil production. And they must realize that the Allied invasion of Libya is directed against their expansion in Africa. And that's how far they will let it go if, say, the West at some stage attacks Pakistan, mm -hmm. which is a very close ally of China. Right. Then the Chinese will also uh, take measures. I think that if we define a bubble by artificially low interest rates and excessive credit expansion, then China has a gigantic bubble. But in the context of economic development, the bubble will burst for sure. I don't know tomorrow or in three weeks or in uh, three months. And, be, and when it bursts, they will also be world champions in money printing. Mm -hmm. They'll be doing exactly what Mr. Bernanke has done. And so I would rather bet that eventually the RMB could weaken against the US dollar. Right. That's why I'm not so bearish about the US dollar right now. I think among the sick currencies, it may be OK for the time being. But when the Chinese bubble bursts, they'll have a recession. But as you know, the US economic history, 1800 to today, how many recessions you had? The mm. Civil War, World War I, the Depression, World War II, and the country still kept on growing. And the same can happen in China. No doubt. But, I mean, I go along with Jim, and I think it's a gigantic bubble and it will burst. Let me And this will have a huge impact on the rest of Asia, on Australia, Canada, Brazil, and the resource producers. What, what about the impact on the, you know, the global economy? Well, it will be very significant because the global economy post-recession 2008 was driven largely by emerging economies mm -hmm. and if China has a recession and the demand from China for resources goes down then commodity prices will also decline that will have a huge impact on the global economy so all right so let's talk investments at this point where do you yes. think investors like I mentioned earlier that you said you know you don't suggest you'd be reluctant to heavily short US equities where do you think you don't like treasuries or where are you there on that well You're I don't I don't like clear. treasuries in the long run, but I think they could rally somewhat for the next three months. They, you know, they're not going to collapse for the next three months. And the dollar probably will strengthen against the euro for the next three months. Mm -hmm. That would be my impression. So if you have large exposure to foreign currencies, I would rather now move back into US dollars. I think there is an asset class in the US that is inexpensive. But it won't go up, but it's inexpensive. It's real estate. Real estate? Yes. Very inexpensive compared to the rest of the world. Gotta be patient though, don't you? Yes, but in investments, you have to be patient. The impatient people, they always buy things that are moving right at the end of a trend, like NASDAQ in year 2000, like commodities and uh, in year 2008 at the peak, and so forth and so on. You better buy things that are depressed, even if you have to wait five years. But they offer some value. They offer some value. What do you make, Mark, of the recent IPOs that we're seeing in the technology world? I think of LinkedIn and how much it came off. I mean, some folks are saying, oh, you know, is this another technology bubble? Others say it's a very different. You called the <laughs> yes. 2000 bubble. Yes. The I think it's bubble. another bubble. You do. Yes, of course. But you understand concept stocks. They but can, is it a concept or is there some real businesses there that are going to There is a real business. So there is a real business, but it's a business that you can enter relatively easy, easily. So I think there will be a lot of competition and I would, uh, and there is also a fad element. I think, I mean, I also have an account at Facebook and so forth, but I think eventually people will get tired of it. Really? Yes, I think so. And it'll just go bust completely. So this I don't think it will go bust bust, but is every technology company in the um, imagination phase is mm. doing well and afterwards when they have to deliver earnings then the PEs go down and so forth. I'm not saying that they all go bust, but I think that they are fully valued and I personally would now not buy them. But I wouldn't have bought a lot of tech stocks that Either. then went up. So, I mean, you know, I'm not the model example for picking tech stocks well.
Because in one year, the Chinese economy will perform poorly. poorly. In other words, that will have a recession. A recession and in China? Yes. Uh, whereby, you know, a recession in China could be a technical recession if you go and slow down from a growth rate of, say, 10% to a growth rate of 3%, there is a recession. Right. And also, I don't believe in the growth figures that China publishes, because if you had adjusted nominal GDP for the true rate of inflation, mm -hmm. then real growth is, of course, much slo slower. But, you know, I want to tell you something that disturbs me in all emerging economies and in many other developed economies. For my taste, in front of luxury hotels, there are far too many Ferraris, Maseratis, Bentleys. Sign of the peak, that is or not what? a good sign. You know, you should see depression when conditions are depressed. I see a boom everywhere. A boom everywhere. Yeah, except for the working class and except for the lower middle class. But among the well to do people, the wealth that is floating around and the prices you pay for high-end properties is incredible. And I think that will come to an end and a lot of people will lose a lot of money. And so I'm ultra careful at the present time. You know, it's interesting in your report, you, you talk about, I'm going to read right from it, Americans have been watching protests against oppressive regimes that concentrate massive wealth in the hands of an elite few, yet in our own democracy, 1% of the people take nearly a quarter of the nation's income, and in inequality, even the wealthy will come to regret. So you're saying we're watching everything that's happening in the Middle East, yet it's right here. Yeah, I was the other day in La Jolla and Newport Beach, Laguna Beach, and you see, I mean, I was in front of a restaurant smoking. I'd never seen so many Ferraris and Maseratis and Bentleys and, you know, fancy cars anywhere in the world. Right. And this is in America. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm not here a social observer. But I'm just saying, basically, there is an opulence among a group of people that is huge. A small group of people. A very small, very small, mm -hmm. not even 1%. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of people that are struggling. And I think this some, that gives me a bad feeling because I've seen so many emerging economies when they were in boom conditions. That was the time to get out. And uh, we had a huge run in asset prices, you know, from the lows in March 2009 until recently. I don't think they'll continue to go up a lot. I rather think that QE2 will come to an end, that we'll have a correction, mm. and then we'll have more money printing, but it may not help the economy at all. I hate to bring it up, yes. but I want to bring it up with you in terms of the fiscal position here in the United States. Yes, You've been very vocal. It's a catastrophe. <laughs> I mean, you, it seems like everybody comes on and says nothing's going to be fixed here, but it's going to have to be fixed. And ultimately, something's going to... Ultimately, gonna... it will be fixed when you have a crisis. But what is that crisis? Uh, David Stockman was on with us this week, yes. and he said we need maybe a financial 9 11 um, to make the folks in Washington come together in terms of dealing with our deficit and our debt ceiling and, and getting spending and taxes. I mean, is that what we need? Well, I think it will be worse. I think what will happen is that these deficits will stay very high and that they will lead to very high inflation rates most likely hyperinflation, not tomorrow, mm -hmm. but over time. All I can say is, I, as you said, I, I travel a lot and I am surprised that the U.S. can publish a consumer price index that is, say, 2% when everything I see is up significantly in price, not a little bit, significantly. Mm -hmm. And so I think here the rate of inflation has to be closer between 5 and 10 percent, and in my opinion, closer to 10 percent and 5 percent. And elsewhere, I also see prices going up substantially. And so the potential for high inflation is actually there, because look, if the U.S. goes into recession, what will happen to tax revenues? They'll collapse. Mm -hmm. They'll collapse. Again. Then the deficit goes up automatically, and that has to be financed with money printing. I love so Mr. Bernanke will be very busy. <laughs> Right. I love talking to you, and but you say things like, if the U.S. goes back into recession, I mean, are you betting that it is? Is it a 60 percent well, chance? Well, for sure, is, uh, the economy right now is slowing down. Although when you walk on the street in New York City, it's like mm. a boom town. Right. But in manufacturing, it's definitely slowing down. 
and uh, employment is unlikely to pick up substantially because who wants to hire people but with is, so many but regulations? It is picking up. Yeah, it a is little better. bit. A lot yeah. of the statistics are better. Yes, but you have to see also what kind of jobs are picking up. You know, mm. low-paying jobs and so forth, and temporary employment. But I agree with you. But part of it is if you lower the value of your currency and you inject trillions of dollars into the economy through money printing, right. then that drops, that dollar bills, these dollar bills drop and then they stimulate the economy for a while, but not permanently. One last quick question. So a safe haven in terms of an investment, is it that depressed real estate? Is that what you say people should well, do? Or I, I think it won't move up, but it's not something that will collapse by another 99%. You know, tech stocks, <laughs> as you know, some of it them can't have, go much further they, down, they, is they, what they went saying? down 90 I think real estate isn't going to go down a lot. I think that in Asia you can still buy a portfolio of equities that would give you a dividend yield of, say, around 5%. I think they'll go down, mm -hmm. but at least you have the 5% cash flow with which you can invest. And I think that fixed interest securities, a lot of corporate bonds and treasuries near term for the next three months are okay.